Hey, I have a question for you. Have you ever heard the expression, words have power? Yeah, me too. And you know what? That was never more true than with the words of Jesus. The things Jesus said have the ability to drastically alter the lives of people. It's true. I mean, it's, it's incredible the change that can come about. It was true when he was on earth, still true today. Take me, for example. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was going through a really difficult time, uh, as many teenagers do. I was uh, confused, uh, conflicted, uh, trying to figure out who I was and what I, who I was going to become. I'd had the great good fortune of being born, uh, I mean, God had really been gracious to me, of having me born in a, a home with loving parents uh, who, who were Christians. My mom, in particular, was an amazing Christian woman. And so I really didn't know a time when either I wasn't loved or I didn't know that, you know, God loved me. But the problem was, as I grew older, uh, even though I, I really think I became a follower of Christ when I was a pretty boy, but I just didn't develop or grow in my faith. And so by the time I was 15, I was really beginning to even have doubts that God existed. And I, I, all I felt saw religion was just guilt and remorse, and that's all. And I just, I was thinking, I, I think maybe I, I just want to abandon this thing. Unfortunately, God sent a youth worker just like Jamie and Talita into my life. And I watched him for a while, and I was amazed at his life. It was different than anyone I'd ever seen before. There was a, a peace, a joy, a purpose. A and so I asked him about it. He said, hey, it's because Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't follow religion. I follow Jesus. That was a whole new idea to me. And I said, um, so how do you get that? He said, here's what you need to do. You need to take the New Testament, and you need to read it every day. And I said, oh, I've tried that. It doesn't work. He said, no, 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 give, give it a chance. You're, you're a different person now. You're older. You're different. Take this New Testament. Read a chapter every day for one year. And if God has not become real and begun to affect your daily life, then you can stop reading it and go believe something else. <laughs> Which I told Jamie and Talita, if they said that to some kid, I would absolutely <laughs> freak out. You don't want to tell a kid that. You know how kids are just kids. But anyway, I took the dare. So I started reading the Bible one chapter a day, every day. And for a while, I, you know, I didn't really, it was more duty. I was, I was determined to prove, this guy was named Paul, I was determined to prove Paul wrong. I was going to wait till the end of the year, shove the Bible back in his face and say, see, I did it, it didn't make any difference. That was just the kind of guy I was back then. But anyway, so I read and I was reading along and I, I would, some, sometimes I would forget, I'd have to turn the light on, back on and get up and read again. And, and, and gradually it began to, I began to get interested. It, it, there were wonderful stories some, some uh, great miracles that I'd somehow missed that Jesus did. Uh, it was beginning to get pretty interesting. But then one day it happened. I was going through a particularly dark time. Uh, I think my girlfriend had broken up with me. I'd failed a big test. It was one of those deals where I was really beginning to question a lot of things. And right that very day, I came to John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And, and it, was, it was like God just spoke to me. It wasn't an audible voice. Uh, it could have been. God can do nothing once, I guess. But in my head and in my heart, I clearly heard him saying, Jim, this is for you. And it was Jesus speaking. And he said, this is what he says, if you abide or continue in my word, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And I mean, that just all came together in my mind and heart, and I understood things I'd never, it all just began to fall into place. And from then on, I was reading every day. And I cannot tell you, I used to have a record of it. I think I finally got rid of it. I think there was, over the next year, there must like 52 times, literally, that I had read things in a day, one of those days, where I literally, God spoke to me and directed me, guided me, protected me, gave me an answer, encouraged me at a very time I needed. It was uncanny. I mean, it was supernatural. It was a God thing. And from then on, my life was forever changed. I hope today the saying of Jesus that we're going to look at will affect you the same way. I hope that God will speak to you today, and I hope you'll see the power that the words of Jesus can have. Let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship here today. Thank you for these many people that have gathered and for those who are wherever they may be watching and listening in. I pray for each and every person. I pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and literally peel our hearts like an onion, get down to the very core of who we are, not all the things we pretend to be, not all the things we have to do, not all the things we try to do to impress people, 
But Lord, you'd get down to who we really, truly, genuinely are. And that, Lord, then you would, you would speak to us and tell each of us what we need to hear. Father, thank you for Jesus, for his willingness to come, live on this earth, and die on a cross for us. Help us today to understand him as never before. Be our teacher, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we want to look at one of the most famous and also one of the most popular sayings of Jesus, uh, things he ever said, and it's this saying right here. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many of you have heard that before or heard someone quoting it? Okay, good many, but a lot of you haven't. All right. Uh, John Stott, famous preacher, called this uh, the most uh, wonderful, tender words that Jesus ever spoke. And a lot of people consider this to be one of, if not the greatest thing Jesus ever said. Today, what we want to do is see if we can understand exactly what it means, what, what Jesus meant when he said it in his time, what it means to us today. So let's get ready, shall we? First thing we want to do then is to consider what did it mean back then. Uh, it's very important when you're trying to study the Bible, uh, New Testament or any book in the Bible, to make sure that you don't rip something out of its context, because you can make the Bible, as you've probably heard, say anything you want, and that's really true. If you take it out of context, it can, it can say all kinds of, of, of weird things. I mean, you know, the old joke about the guy who flipped open the Bible and said, God speak to me, and he opened it and said, and, jo- and uh, Judas went out and hung himself. And he said, oh, that's the one like that, and give me something else. And he opened another place and said, and you go do likewise. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing, without con- that's content, big problem. <laughs> give me a big problem. You don't want to do that. Don't do that. So what we want to do is, what did Jesus say? When did he say it, and what did he mean by it? Okay. Here's what was going on. The only place we read, coming to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, is in, guess where? The Math- Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. Jesus is actually in the last few months of his earthly life, and he's on his way to Jerusalem to face the cross. This was a very important, pivotal, emotional time in the life of Christ. And it really can tell, a lot of the Gospels cover this period with more time than they do most anything else. It was such a crucial time. Because Jesus knew where he was going. It says in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing full well what he was going to encounter. And, uh, and so this is an important time in the life of Christ. Something else I think is interesting to note, if you know anything about Matthew, you know anything about Matthew? Matthew was a, a tax collector, which means he was considered the worst of the worst. He basically uh, was like a collaborator. He was like a traitor. He was working for the Romans, and he was stealing from the people, piling their misery upon misery on them. The Romans had high taxes, but a tax collector could take anything else he wanted and keep it for himself, anything that he could get. And so the Jews despised and hated the tax collectors. All of them hated him except, guess who? Jesus. He loved everyone, no matter who they were. And he called Matthew and said, come follow me, be one of my followers. And apparently there was some other stuff going on. We know maybe Matthew had been listening to his teaching and watching his miracles, because this happened up in that little town where Jesus spent a lot of time, up on the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. He said, Matthew, come follow me. Matthew got up from his tax booth, left the money on the table, and went to follow Jesus. Amazing. As a result of that, I think it's fascinating that Matthew is the only gospel writer who includes this. I think it may well be that because he was so despised that when Jesus called him, Matthew understood the power of this invitation that he remembered hearing Jesus say, had such forgiveness and burden-lifting ability in his own life that even though the other gospel writers probably heard it and just said, well, that's a good one, but I think there's some others I like better, to Matthew, it was one of the most important things Jesus ever said. Today, this may be one of the most important things you've ever heard Jesus say. Another thing we need to know about what was going on at the time that this was said is the kind of the bigger context. You know, oftentimes if you're looking at something up close, you can you get one picture, but if you'll step back and get a bigger picture, then you really understand better. I remember I, some of you know I love biblical art. <laughs> and years ago when I was first getting into it, I'd come across a painting in a book that I dearly loved. And I used, I, matter of fact, I used it in teaching a couple of times, and I, man, I, I just loved looking at it. It was a fantastic picture. Little did I know that it was actually part of a much larger uh, painting. And uh, later, some years later, when Alan and I were traveling, I was walking through a museum uh, in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, actually. Uh, if you've ever been there, it's in the Hermitage, incredible museum. Everyone should go there. Anyway, I was walking, but here is this painting, and in the corner is what I thought was the full painting. It was just a tiny little part of it. Sometimes the Bible is like that. We think we know God, we think we know the Bible, but we're only looking at Him like this, when in reality, 
God is so much greater and grander than we can ever imagine. And Jesus is like that. So what's going on in Jesus' life, I think if we can understand what was happening, we'll appreciate this statement so much more. What was going on, Jesus, according to Matthew 10, has just sent the 12 disciples out to do ministry. During this uh, long uh, several-month period that Jesus took to go from Galilee down to Jerusalem in order to go for this last trip, to, in order to go face the cross, be crucified, and then rise again, it was like he was it's just visiting all the different cities as he was going along in villages. In other words, it was almost like he was making one last grand tour. He didn't want anybody not to hear the good news of his love and the fact that he was getting ready to go and pay the price of their sin. But, but there were places he couldn't get to, and it's, so it's fascinating because right around this time, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles, his main followers, and according to Luke chapter 10, he also sent out 70 other chosen people. So you would consider maybe this the, the cream of the crop, the, the core people, and he sends them out during this time. Now, chronology is a little difficult to tell in the Gospels. I mean, they, the problem is we all, many of us, uh, <clears throat> study, like to study things in, in a more sequential, sequential way. You know, like if I'd been writing a, the gospel, I'd put, and Jesus healed a man, 1202, you know. 1215, he sat down and said, I am tired. You know, admit, that's, that's how I would have written, you know. But the, not the gospel writers. They were Middle Eastern. Jesus was Middle Eastern. Surprise! He was Middle Eastern. And as a result, yes, thank you. Thank you. Amen. Um, so, so because of that, they approached things very differently. They were much more interested in what was happening, the relationships, what was going on the bigger picture, and not these little minutiae. So uh, we're not completely sure what was happening, but I think if you'll study those two chapters, Luke 10, Matthew 11, you'll get a picture of what was happening. Jesus was probably alone. As a matter of fact, it says we know that because in verse 11, chapter 1, right after he spends the entire chapter sending the 12 out, guess what? In verse 11 it says he, he departs from there and goes to teach and preach in their cities. So here he is. He, he's alone. He's traveling, and he's about to encounter one of the most emotionally sensitive periods of his life. Sound like a recipe for a difficult time, doesn't it? And that's exactly what happened. Jesus finds out as he travels, and if you read chapter 11 more, you'll get into it, and also chapter 10, you'll see that Jesus begins to face more opposition and rejection as he's going through these villages, even though he, some people are responding, sadly many aren't. The reason is because a lot of them are just there for the show. You know, they want to see a miracle. Give us a good miracle. Come on. Hey, Mary, he's going to heal someone. Come here, you got to see this. You know, that kind of thing. It's a uh, feed us, feed us. You know, do the feeding thing again. I was there when you did that before. That meal was delicious. You know, we got 5,000 of us. How about another one? That kind of thing. They were not really seeking him. They were just seeking what he could do for them. And so as a result, when he stopped doing a lot of those things, and you'll notice that the miracle, uh, outward miracle, large miracle ministry of Jesus peaks, and then begins to fall off because as he begins to talk about the deeper, more important things of his coming, the people begin to, to, to not follow him as much. Uh, Jesus', Jesus three-year ministry can be broken out as a, a year of, uh, of obscurity, year one. Year two, a year of popularity, lots of miracles, big miracles. Year three, year of rejection. As he begins to challenge the religious leaders and they begin to challenge him, there's a lot of conflict going on. Jesus is experiencing this right here. As a result... He reveals uh, some things in his heart and mind in verses 25 through 30 that I didn't think we're going to see any place else or rarely in Scripture. Did you know that in all the New Testament, there's only four places that we read the words of Jesus praying? Did you know that? Well, there's a lot of places that talks about Jesus praying, but what was he saying? The New Testament doesn't tell us. But when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, his dear friend, who had died, and his dear friends, Mary and Martha, were there weeping their hearts out. Jesus prayed, Father, and, and he prays, give me, give me the opportunity to, to bring Lazarus out of the grave. Uh, he prays when he's in the upper room. Uh, that's probably the longest prayer we have this recorded. Uh, John 17, you should read that beautiful prayer. And, of course, he prays on the cross three different times. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then the fourth time, right here. How significant. So what I want you to see is this. And again, I'm trying not to wear you out on this preparation, but it's like anything else. If you, if you see something and you think you appreciate it, if you step back and see the entire masterpiece, then it really blows you away. And you see it in its full context. That's what I want you to see, what Jesus is about to say in the context of what he's going through right now. 
So, let's move on. Here's what he has to say. Matthew chapter 11, we'll begin in verse 25. At that time, meaning uh, right after he'd had this conflict uh, with uh, these people, uh, Matthew uh, talks about two followers of John who've come to question him. Uh, is he still the one? Um, actually, that probably happened earlier, but I think Matthew puts it here in a thematic way to show this conflict that was going on repeatedly in Christ as he traveled from city to city, village to city. At this very same time that all this was going on, Jesus said, and he begins to pray, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants, these things being the messages that he's been giving about, about salvation, about him being the one and only Savior. Verse 26, yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. It was pleasing in your sight to do it this way, God. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. End of prayer. And then Jesus makes this amazing invitation. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So, like we said, there's two parts to this. There's the prayer, there's the invitation. Let's look at them, see if we can understand both. First, the prayer. What did you notice in this prayer, in uh, verses 25 through 27, that particularly jumps out at you as you look at it? What, what do you notice? It's in red. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you pass the class. You're not helping yourselves enough. It's, it's the word Father, isn't it? It's incredible. Three verses uses the word Father five times. It's amazing. This, this is, the word Father is used as many times in these verses as it is anywhere else in the whole New Testament. Why? Again, because I think it's a reflection of the fact that Jesus is going through as a human being. He was God in human form. He was a God-man. But His humanness was real. So when He was in the wilderness, it was a hard time. He struggled. He he. he he was weak. He, he fasted. The angels had to come and minister to him. When he was in the garden before the cross, what was he doing? Crying out, oh God, let this cro cross pass by. Don't let me have to do this. In his humanness, that's what he was crying. In his, in his deity, he was obedient even to the point of death on a cross. It's amazing. I think we see the same thing here. And I think this has been so overlooked by Bible students so often. I think Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and this is not an easy time. And, and the disciples, the 70 may be gone. He's alone. He's traveling. He's going from city to city. He's facing a lot of tough questions. And I think that he realizes that what he needs to do is to talk to his father in order to be strengthened. The reason I'm making a big point of that is this. I think at a time of great stress, when I think he may have been alone, Jesus turned to his Father in prayer, just as Jesus, what? Beckons us to come to his Father, to come to him in a time of need. Jesus says, come unto me in your time of need. What did he do? He modeled that for us. Do you see that? Do you see how lovely that is? That's absolutely remarkable. And this word Father to use is such a special word, a word that was not used in uh, to talk to God in the, before Jesus came. Never occurred. Some plural uses of it, our Father, but the idea that I could call the God of the universe my Abba, which is a, a word which literally means Papa or Daddy. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> I mean, it sent shockwaves throughout the religious leaders of, of Jesus' day. I, I, we have a daughter named Lydia. Who, uh, we have four children, but our daughter Lydia lives out in Seattle with her husband Leland always begins her prayers this way, Daddy God, and then she speaks, I, and she's done that for years. I love that. I think that is such a great picture of how God wants us to pray. Uh, it, it's fascinating. I've been reading a book by these two ladies who are experts in Jesus and his Jewishness, and they write, Jesus taught his disciples to address God as Father as he himself spoke to God as my Father in the singular. In Jewish prayer, God was sometimes called our God, but my Father was daring almost unheard of. Every time Jesus referred to God as my Father, his listeners would have heard it as a bold and shocking statement. Great uh, teacher by the name of Leon Morse, now with the Lord, says, Jesus altered forever the way we think of God by praying in this way. 
Let me ask you a question. How do you view God? When you think of God, how do you picture him? Now, if you're here today and, and you and you're, don't believe in God, or you're not a follower of Jesus, then you may have no picture, and that's fine. I understand that. But for those of you who claim to be followers of Jesus or claim to be Christians, how do you think of God in your mind? Is he, is he, is he old? Is he hard of hearing? Is he far off? Is he busy? Is he unapproachable? Is he judgmental? Is he harsh? Is, is, is he keeping tabs? What is, who is God to you? And I think one of the most important things that if we're going to understand this invitation that Jesus is going to give us when he finishes this prayer, we're going to have to have a different view of God. And so I want to encourage you to think of God as that loving, precious, kind, gentle, wise, approachable, daddy God, papa God, that's who he is. I don't know, for some of you this may be difficult because your experience in, in, in your family of origin was not good when it came to, uh, to God. Uh, and it was, you remember uh, your dad was not a good father, you know, he, or maybe you didn't have a father. Uh, you grew up without a father in your home. Or maybe, <laughs> you know, you wish that uh, he hadn't been there because of the way he treated you or treated others. Maybe you suffered greatly in your home because of who your father, what he did to you. Let me encourage you, don't use this illustration then. But think back of somebody that has cared for you. Maybe a mother, a single mom who raised you. Maybe an older brother or sister. Maybe a, 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 another family member, an auntie, an uncle, whatever it may be. Think of that person who you could go to, who you knew would always love you no matter what, who was willing to take the time to stop what they were doing and listen to you. That's who God is. That's who God is. So when one said, you want to know who God is? Look at Jesus. That's why he came, so we would understand who God is. Isn't that amazing? Very important. God is our Papa. He is our Daddy God. Another thing about his prayer that I find really fascinating is he basically praises God for hiding the gospel. Isn't that weird? He praises God for hiding the gospel from who? From the wise, the learned, the, the, you know, the people who think they have it all figured out, the educated, the brilliant, you know, the people who feel like they don't even need God because <laughs> they're so wonderful, you know, that, those people. And instead, he makes the gospel so clear that even a child, literally the Greek means someone without speech, and he's not just talking about an infant who's not learned to talk yet, because in the biblical days, uh, children didn't talk much around adults, especially around male adults. I mean, today, obviously, it's very different. We're very child-centric, which I, I think applaud. I think it's great. But back in the, in the first century, children didn't speak much until uh, they were like maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. I mean, you had to be an older child. If you were a little child, you just didn't talk much around, around men. And so that's kind of what he's talking about. He's saying, you need to be like, so he wasn't necessarily saying you need to be like an infant in arms, but he was saying you need to be like a, a, like a little child if you're going to come to me. Uh, this word hiding doesn't really mean he was purposely hiding. It's, a, it's called a Hebrew extreme, uh, or an exaggerated statement. He's using an exaggerated point, uh, a statement in order to make his point. It, 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 G, God was so cons desired so much to make the gospel available to the people who see themselves as not being important, as not being significant, as not being worthy, that it, it almost appears he's hiding it from those who think they are so worthy. That's the whole point of it. He purposely designed it to be understood by the simple and sincere and to seem baffling to the self-wise and self-important. I love the fact that he explains this over in Luke 18 by his actions. Remember, he remember that he was real busy this day, and the, uh, some of the parents brought their ch little children to Jesus to bless him, and, and the disciples said, oh, go away, go away, Jesus is too busy. And what did Jesus say? Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Isn't that beautiful? And then he turned to the adults, and he said, truly I said to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. How does a child receive things? Think about it for a minute. How does a child receive things? Quickly? Openly? Quick to believe? Quick, 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 quick to trust? Yeah? 
quick to, quick to feel guilt when they know they've done wrong and they've hit it and you discover it, you know, and they begin to burst out in tears. I'm so sorry, you know. You know what I'm saying? Tender, soft. Isn't that different from so many adults? Wise, strong, capable, self-sufficient. Isn't that who we are when we get older? I mean, you don't hear seven-year-olds saying, screw it over, Dad, I'm going to drive home. You know, they just they don't do that, right? I tell you, it's amazing when you start thinking about how God wants us to approach Him. Not as though we have earned it, but as though we could never earn it. You understand that? You know, I, I don't give assignments very often, but I'm going to give you an assignment today. I want to encourage you to, later this afternoon, over lunch, after you've had time to, you know, have lunch and you're sitting in the chair or on the, at the beach or wherever you may be, stop and ask yourself this question. How does a child differ from an adult? And think of all the different ways. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. We're talking about the obvious ones. There's so many more. I would encourage you, give that some thought, and you will know more about this passage than you think you do. Well, last thing, the Father, uh, Jesus says, was pleased to make Jesus the sole source of knowing the Father. Jesus is our one and only mediator. He is our one and only Savior. Notice what he says in verse 27. All things handed over to me. No one can know the Father unless they know me. No one can know me unless they know the Father. And anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal it. One of the things that Jesus comments on here in this prayer is something that he does more and more as he approaches the end of his life, his earthly life. He talks about the fact that there is no other way to heaven except through him. And I think it's important for us to realize that while we adult, educated, uh, international people like to consider the fact that there are probably many ways to heaven and any of them will work, just be sincere and follow your path, Jesus would disagree. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one, no one goes to heaven unless they believe in me. Now, I'm not saying you have to be in the Christian culture. I'm just saying you have to be a follower of Jesus. Those two are not always the same. But you do have to believe in Jesus as a crucified Savior for your sin who rose again to show that he paid the price. And I have to believe that my going to heaven is entirely based on him and on nothing else. That is the meaning of what Jesus says in this prayer. And I think it's almost as though he's kind of trying to bring himself back to the center after being in this uh, difficult time that he's been in. And this truth is very important. Listen, listen. You may want to reject Jesus, but you can't have God without Jesus. You may want to believe in God uh, and believe in only Jesus and, and not follow God. You can't do it. They are one and the same. That's essentially what he was saying. So he prays this prayer that is profound and is amazing and, and I think helped him. And then coming out of this, what has to be a time of some stress emotionally, the, some struggling to put it all back together, what does Jesus do? He reveals his head in the prayer. Now he's going to reveal his heart. Look what he says. The invitation. Read this with me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an amazing statement. First thing, though, we need to do is stop. Because unfortunately, these words have been so, I think, misunderstood, and I've even heard the misunderstood in churches and heard a sermon, and, and I'm sure the pastor was doing his best, but man, he was way over here, and he was missing, I think, the core of what Jesus is saying. Because we need to realize that this is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus did not say, come to me and your life will be easy and pain-free. Yes? No, he didn't say that. Jesus did not say, having a bad day, I'm your man. Okay? <laughs> I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Jesus did not say, being a Christian is easy and requires little commitment. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. Jesus was not trying to get people by doing this. <laughs> Attendance was up 60% since Pastor Bob installed the new seats. Man, who wouldn't like to go to a church like that, huh? Yeah, recliners and free beverages. I mean, come on. Let's get a crowd. No, that's not what Jesus is saying, although unfortunately a lot of people have tried to take Jesus' words out of context 
and use them to say those things. What was Jesus saying? Well, I think if we ask some questions, kind of like a, a, uh, uh, an inspector, maybe we can find out what he was saying, okay? And let the text speak to us. First of all, who is calling? It's Jesus. And he is calling what? Us to come to him. What was the word he uses? Come unto me all. Yeah, not some, not those of you who've earned it, not those of you who've given enough money, not those of you who look like me, not those of you who look like North Americans. No, that was not it at all. He said, come unto me, all ye, okay? Think about that. The one who created us is what? He's calling us home. He's not calling us someplace else. He's calling us to himself. I love that. And who is he calling? He's calling all of us who are exhausted trying to become acceptable to God. I think this is the key thing if you're going to understand this passage, is that the main thing Jesus is talking about here is to the people of his day. And the people of his day were what? Struggling because they were being taught by the religious leaders that in order to go to heaven, they had to follow a very detailed, exhausting set of rules and regulations. The Old Testament has, oh, 600 and some commands in it. Things that thou, thou shalt not do. You know, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. Thou shalt do this. But the thing we need to understand that the reason, as we understand later in the New Testament, that all these rules and regulations are here is so that we can realize that we can't keep them. Now, yeah, some of them are wisdom and, and are helpful and we can still apply today. But the main reason God gave them, as Paul said, was to be a, a teacher, a tutor, to teach us our need for forgiveness. Jesus was running into people all the time that basically thought they were keeping all these rules, which is ridiculous. And, and, and Jesus would even ask them, you know, uh, they would ask, well, what must I do to go to heaven? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, love your neighbor as yourself. And people would say, oh, I've done that every, uh, every day, which is outrageous. Of course you haven't. And, and Jesus would often explain in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what he was explaining. For example, uh, he would say, um, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not uh, uh, commit adultery. And so one of the religious leaders in his day would say, oh, oh I've never committed adultery. Adultery, therefore, I deserve to go to heaven because I've never slept with another woman. And Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. He who was not, but he was lusted after a woman is the same as sleeping with a woman. And you go, well, that leaves me out of it. Thou shalt not kill. I've never murdered, taken a life. Jesus said, what that means is, even if you get angry at someone, it's like you're murdering them in your mind. And who hadn't done that, you know? I wish I had. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? The standard of God is so high. The whole point of the Old Testament is it's impossible to reach. That's why Paul said, all have sinned and come short of the holy standard of God. The only answer is for us to have someone who can remove our guilt because we never can do that. So he's basically calling people to come from this legalistic, self-righteous, man-made system of right and rules that were established by the religious leaders. And later, when he gets to Jerusalem and he's in the temple teaching, he even explains it. Look at this. He said, hey, these uh, people uh, uh, who are the religious leaders, if, they, if they're seating in the chair of Moses, if they tell you something that Moses said, you should do it. But if they tell you all this other garbage, forget it. Because they tie up heavy burdens and lay them onto men's shoulders. And, but they themselves are unwilling to, to even do them at all. And so here were the people of Jesus. They're just being piled on with these, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. You, can, you must follow this exactly. You must say this exactly right. You, uh, it was just more and more and more and more. Now, how would that apply to us today? Let, let's take it out of the first century and bring it to us today. How would that apply to us today? How, how are we heavy laden? Could it be that by people who are just trying so hard to make up for the things they've done wrong? A lot of people believe that at the end of time when they stand before God, he's going to have a big tote board. And on one side is going to be all the good things you've done, on the other side is going to be all the bad things you've done. And basically he's going to add them all up, and if the good outweighs the bad, you're in! Come on in! Otherwise it's <laughs> down for you. Other people, I think, struggle with this kind of thing because they believe that somehow if they go to the right church, you know, our, our church is good and it's the best one, and you're not so good, and we're going to be there, and you're probably not. And, you know, we use the King James. Yeah, you know, we're going to be there, you know, that kind of thing. And, or I've been to church all my life, you know, I never miss, you know. <laughs> so is the custodian. Doesn't mean he's necessarily going to go there. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean anything. Actions are great. They're, they're wonderful. If the Spirit is in you, then the actions mean something. Otherwise, they are empty burdens that you've piled 
on yourself, whether it's church or civic uh, involvement or, 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 or being a person who never loses your temper or, or being determined that, you know, you've worked for the same company even though they've treated you horribly because you're just so good. And that goodness is somehow going to make a difference with God. Jesus was speaking directly about that here. He was saying it's not that. What are we called to do? This is pretty clear. All right? Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. We have to admit that we are weary and in need of rest, that we have been trying way too long to make ourselves good enough to go to heaven. And as long as we're consumed without self-effort, we will never find the real answer to getting to heaven. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah uses the same word, come, very same concept. He explains it this way. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins were as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they were like crimson, they will be like wool. In Jesus' day, you couldn't get something white if it got, if it got stained, especially badly stained with blood or, or some dye or something. It was just that color. Guess what? Today, we've got bleach. <laughs> Thank God for bleach. I spill stuff on it. The good news is Jesus is the bleach of our lives. You understand? That's right. Uh, this word reason, fascinating, it basically means to bring an argument to an end. <laughs> That's what it means. Come and let us bring an argument, bring the contention to an end. The contention we have with each other, the contention we have with God, we come with peace. But how about the yoke thing? Why did he use the word yoke? Do you know? Well, uh, it, it's, a, it's fascinating to really think about, and I want to uh, ask someone who uh, I think has some real insight into this to come and talk to you for a minute. It's Pastor Barack. Uh, yeah, uh, Pastor Brock, one of our pastors, as you may know, is from Kenya. He grew up in a, a culture where yokes were used. Uh, and, uh, oh, a couple, two weeks ago when we were working on this, uh, I was working on this, we were sitting with a group and we were talking about it, and we began to talk about what is a yoke. And I asked uh, Barack his thoughts. And, man, he had insights into a yoke that I had never seen. And it really helped me to understand this passage. So, Barack, you're here, aren't you? Yeah, come on up, buddy. So I'm going to ask Barack if he would come and explain to you, growing up in Kenya, what he saw about a yoke. Hey, buddy, how you doing? You okay? Good to see you. Well, hello. Uh, it's great to be here at Gloria. Always a quick side, and it's good to be here today. So um, I grew up in a city as well, in Nairobi, and one of the greatest joys of, of growing up in a city was once in a while traveling up country. And actually, in, in, in doing that, once I decided to just stay up country for a few years, so I actually stayed with my uncle uh, for about a year or a year and a half or two. And um, what, what my uncle used to do, he used to be a teacher, but he also used to be a subsistence farmer. And that simply meant that he grew food for himself and his family as well. And every time I read the verse that says, my yoke, uh, I think of that time and what I saw um, in that region of the country. The first thing that comes to mind when I, when I hear the word yoke is this, that for a yoke to work, two animals must be on the yoke. A yoke doesn't work with one cattle. A yoke doesn't work with one donkey. It works with two of them. So for a yoke to be effective, there must be two animals on it. And, and how it would work is the, the farmer would look for a weak animal and place it in a yoke with a more experienced, stronger animal. You can't put two strong bulls on a yoke because they would both pull in different directions and, and the farmer wouldn't achieve anything. So he would place a stronger animal with a weaker animal and, and over time, the weaker animal would grow, learn, and understand how to work with the yoke because it's being taught by the stronger animal. Another thing that was really, really important was that the farmer would, would use different types of, um, of material to make the yoke easier. No two yokes are similar because all, no two animals are similar. So what they would do is some people would make different yokes for different animals. And, and what I remember from back home is that because it's expensive to make a yoke, they would just make one. But what the farmer would do is anytime they were changing animals, they would pad the yoke with cloth so that it would be easier on the animal's neck so that the animal doesn't struggle and so that the animal doesn't fight. Another thing that is really, really interesting is that a yoke is difficult to put on an animal for the first time because the bull doesn't understand what's happening. And, and it's, it's difficult. It's not the natural state for the animal. 
And, and so it's, it's something that the, the animal has to be submitted into for it to understand. And, and the reason that comes to mind is because when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, what Jesus is actually saying for me, what I see in this passage is that Jesus Christ is inviting me to his yoke and he's inviting me to be in the yoke with him so that I can learn from him and I can grow with him and become a better Christian. And as I submit to that yoke he's calling me to, I grow and I become better in, in my life and in my walk. But the, <laughs> Amen. the beauty of it is this, that the farmer doesn't send an email to the bull. <laughs> the farmer doesn't sit down with the presentation saying, well, listen here, this is how the yoke works, okay? I'm going to put it around you, and, and then we're we going to discuss this. The lesson in the yoke comes from the bull being in the yoke. The lessons in Christianity comes from me being submitted to the yoke of Christ. Amen. Good. Good job, buddy. Good job. See what I mean? Isn't he great? Man, we are so glad to have him on our staff. He's fantastic. He is at Creekside most of the time. He's actually our uh, site shepherd there, we call him. And so that's why you may not see him here very often. Uh, but I think he's going to be actually teaching one of these sayings coming up in a few weeks. So you'll get to hear him. Uh, but isn't that terrific? I mean, this, this, is, this is absolutely amazing. There is so much here that Jesus was communicating to people who probably understood because they'd seen a yoke every day their whole lives. We, we who haven't seen it don't understand. So one thing I do think that I, that I did see that I think is good is that what does Jesus say? He says, take my yoke, what? Upon you. This is one yoke that no one else can put on you. You have to put it on yourself. Very important to remember that. Today, Jesus wants to come in and be harnessed with you so he can make such a difference in your life. So, in wrapping up, what will be the result? We'll find what? Rest for our souls. Man, anybody here not need rest? We need rest from the heavy burdens of, of spiritual trying to earn our way. We need rest just from the stresses and pressures of the, the Satan and his attacks on us and the struggle we have in life. I love the fact that what Jesus was really doing here, most people believe, was quoting uh, Jeremiah who saw in the midst of the suffering and the calamity of Jerusalem falling, the fact that even in the midst of the worst of times, God can still be with you and give you rest. Uh, Jeremiah wrote, this is what the Lord says, Stop at the crossroads, look around, ask for the old godly way, walk in it, travel in its path, and you will find rest for your souls. Man, I love that. Absolutely amazing. The rabbi says what? Come to the Torah. The priest says, come to the sacrament. The imam says, come to the five pillars. The Hindu sage says, come achieve dharma. The Buddhist monk says, come to the eightfold path. The humanist says, come to yourself. The uh, moralist says, come do better. The legalist says, come try harder. Only Jesus says what? Come to me. And if we do, what will be the result? Today, these things can be true in your life. Jesus will take your guilt away and your shame. Jesus will absolutely free you from this endless trying to be good enough. Measure up. Meet the standard of whoever it was that laid all that stuff on you. He will be with you every day as your guide, just like he was mine from the time I was 15 on. I felt that. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will take away your burdens. He will give you soul rest. Let me finish by telling you, my favorite author uh, the last 20 years is a guy named John Ortberg. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not, but he writes Amazing books. I don't always agree with everything, uh, but that's what I love about him is the fact that he expands my thinking and helps me to think things I've never thought before. And uh, he has a book that I particularly like. I actually tried to read it when it first came out, 2014, I think it was. It's called uh, Soul Keeping, uh, Caring for the Most Important Part of You. And I just couldn't get into it, and uh, I think that I, uh, I just wasn't ready for it. But recently, uh, when we were moving our uh, office this past summer, I saw it, picked it up, and started to read it. Absolutely touched me deeply. And essentially, the thesis of the book is this. Our souls are the most important part of us. We oftentimes ignore them, don't we? We think about our minds. We think about our bodies a lot. We think about maybe even our spirits. I need to be spiritually engaged with my, you know, uh, spiritually minded, that kind of thing. But our souls, how often do we think about our souls? And basically, he talks about the fact that we need to care for our souls. We need to, we need to realize that our, how important our souls are. And they need to be rested. They need to be exercised. They need to be 
fed. It's really an interesting book. But, but one thing he said that has stuck with me that I think I'll never forget, uh, much of this book is the remembrance of his conversations with a man named Dallas Willard, who was a uh, philosopher, head of the philosophy department for a while at, at USC, University of Southern California, but a wonderful Christian man. And he basically, in his conversations, this was really the latter part of Dallas Willard's life, he was about to die of cancer. Uh, but John, and he had some wonderful conversations. Listen to the words of Dallas Willard that John writes. Dallas said to me, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an internal destiny in God's great universe. That's the most important thing for you to remember. You should repeat it regularly to yourself. Brother John, you think you have to be someplace else or accomplish something more in order to find rest for your soul, but it's right here. God has yet to bless anyone except right where they are. Your soul is not just something, listen, your soul is not just something that lives on after your body dies. It is the most important part about you right now. It is your life. And then Dallas Willard told this story. He said, there once was a small child who crept into his father's bedroom to sleep. In the dark, knowing his father was present was enough to take away the child's sense of aloneness. Is your face turned toward me, Father, he would ask. Yes, his father replied. My face is turned toward you. Only then could the child go to sleep. Today, there are a lot of us who can't sleep. We feel afraid. We feel alone. We feel overcome. We're so tired and weary. But Jesus calls to us from a dark room. We can't see him, but we can hear his voice. Someday the room will be bright and filled with light, and we'll be able to see Jesus. But for now, we must see him with eyes of faith and listen to his voice. And what does his voice say? Come to me. Stop trying to do everything yourself. Come to me, and I will help you, and I will give you rest for your soul. And we ask, Jesus, is your face turned towards me? And Jesus replies, my child, my face is always turned towards you. Today, Jesus is saying to each of us, whether you believe it or not, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Rest for whatever it is that you're battling. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are uh, we're thankful for your love. We don't deserve it. Lord, uh, we, uh, we rejected you. You made us perfect and put us in a garden, in a paradise, and it was us who ruined things. And yet, Lord, you did not leave us in that mess, but you willingly came yourself in the person of a God-man, Jesus, who was willing to give himself, his sinless self for us. Father, thank you for doing that. And Lord, I pray today that you would help us to stop being caught up in all the many other ways of trying to, to find purpose and meaning in life and ultimately go to heaven. And Lord, realize that it's only, only by coming to you. Thank you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.